Great. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about mutations in Erdheim chester disease, and I'm really going to start out from the beginning. So I apologize if it seems a little bit uh, simple to start, but I just want to make sure that everyone was on the same page. So mutations are changes to the DNA code, remembering that DNA is a template or blueprint for all the proteins that make up the cell. And there are different kinds of mutations. So there are big mutations that involve chromosomes, which may cover uh, uh, thousands of genes. And they include deletions, which are gaps uh, in the chromosome, duplications where one part of the chromosome is, is doubled or tripled or more, and inversions where, where the uh, DNA is actually flipped. There can also be um, insertions that go from one chromosome to another, and, and translocations where a bit of one chromosome is swapped uh, between a pair. And those big changes can also exist on a much smaller level. And instead of occurring over hundreds of thousands of bases, can occur over just a, over just a few. So not all changes to DNA can be harmful. And you have to remember that only about 2% of the DNA uh, encodes proteins. And, and genes are the unit of DNA that encode proteins. So that a mutation here in an area that doesn't encode a protein is much less likely to be harmful. We used to call that part of, of the uh, DNA junk DNA. It turns out that that's an oversimplification and that we realize now that that DNA can be important in regulating uh, how DNA, DNA and the chromosomes are packed in the cells, but it may also help to uh, regulate and control the expression of genes that may be far away. And mutations that occur in the gene have the potential to be harmful, but remember that we're all different from one another, so many of that those differences are due to variations or mutations that in proteins that make us all unique. So not all uh, mutations are, are harmful. Some mutations can be what are called silent mutations. We're remembering that, that uh, each uh, amino acid, which is a building block of a protein, can, is, uh, is um, coded by, by a triplet of three different uh, DNA bases. And there are four different DNA bases, and so there are potentially 64 combinations of, of three. But there are only 20 amino acids. And so a number of the amino acids are, co are encoded by uh, different combinations of, of base pairs. So in this example, you can see that this GCA encodes the amino acid alanine, and this GCC, which is a mutation of that A, encodes the same amino acid. So even though there's been a mutation, there hasn't been a change in the uh, coding. There are a number of other things that can affect uh, whether mutations are harmful. Some things depend on where the mutation takes place. What cell incurs the mutation? And in the case of, of bone marrow cells, and Erdheim-Chester disease is ultimately a disease of bone marrow cells, uh, we know that there are a group of cells called stem cells that can repopulate the entire marrow. And that's the basis of bone marrow transplant, that you can take bone marrow from a donor and transfer it to a patient and have that, that donor bone marrow repopulate all the all the blood cells for the patient. So a mutation that takes place in a stem cell is something that's likely to be transmitted down to all the other cells in, in the blood. But a mutation that takes place in a more mature cell, a cell that's likely to only live for a few days, is only going to last for the number of days that that cell is going to live. In the case of Erdheim-Chester disease, this is a disease of what's called the monocyte macrophage uh, lineage. Uh, 
And these are blood cells that are important in regulating the immune system. They're, these are blood cells that, that help to uh, rid the body of, of cells and uh, debris that, uh, from inflammation and infection. Um, and so mutations that occur upstream of, of these cells are mutations that have at least the potential to impact Erdheim-Chester disease. You know, we all live in, in equilibrium and, and uh, the immune system is there to help protect us from some of these mutations. And when an immune system has the potential to recognize uh, a mutated cell, and that results in, in cell death, and we think that that's something that happens on a very frequent basis. Sometimes, though, those mutations and the immune system uh, is not sufficient to be able to regulate that. And for a period of time, those, those tumor cells may be uh, held in a state, state of suspended animation where there are some tumor cells there, but they're not really causing the problem. But then, at some point, those tumor cells escape, and they start to grow and cause problems. So where do the mutations come from? You know, we live in, a, in an environment that, that has uh, many different potential mutagens. And some of them have been well described. So we've known for nearly 200 years that coal tar induces uh, cancer in, in, uh, in people. And things like asbestos and arsenic and radium are are well-known environmental mutagens uh, that can increase the risk of cancer. But for most patients, there's no known exposure. And so, so it's uh, in some ways a mystery as to what causes that, that original mutation. Uh, we do know that there's ambient radiation in the atmosphere. You know, that's a potential cause. But Many patients want to know what, what it was that caused that mutation, but the, the truth is that in most cases we really don't know. Most of the mutations that, that we see in Erdheim-Chester disease are what are called missense or point mutations. And those are mutations of a single nucleic acid, the result in a change of one uh, amino acid to another in a protein. And the protein that's most commonly affected, maybe, uh, I seem to be stuck. There we go. Okay, um, and the mutation that's, that's uh, the protein that's most commonly affected is BRAF, which is the gene that we've been hearing about all day today. And, and the most common mutation is a single amino acid mutation uh, of, of uh, where there's a substitution of valine at position 600, so each of the new, the amino acids in the protein is numbered one, two, I'm not quite sure how many amino acids there are in, in BRAF, but there are more than 600. Um, and there's a substitution of, of glutamic acid for valine and using a, a nomenclature where we give each amino acid a particular letter, that's B600E. That particular mutation uh, is a mutation that was well known before it was first identified in Erdheim-Chester disease, and it was first identified in, in melanoma and seen in as many as 50% of patients who have melanoma. And it's seen in a wide range of other cancers as well. And another uh, cancer of the blood system, hairy cell leukemia, uh, virtually 100% of patients have this BRAF B600E mutation. And we think that what cause, that the reason that the same mutation causes all of these different diseases is likely due to um, the type of cell that's affected by that original mutation. 
And, and the short story of what happens when that mutation takes place in BRAF is that BRAF becomes activated and starts to work in an uncontrolled way. And to take a, this, take, look, take a look at this in a little bit more detail, just so I'd like to explain that BRAF is a kind of protein that's a kinase. And a kinase is a protein that transfers a phosphate group from one protein to another. And just as the Olympic uh, relay will transfer the torch from one runner to another as it goes from Athens to Milano in, in 2026, so these uh, kinases transfer this phosphate group from one protein to another in a chain. And BRAF is actually in the central part of this, this relay. And uh, Dr. Danio described the cytokines, or growth factors, that are part of the environment of, of the uh, Erdheim-Chester disease lesion. And typically what happens is in, in normal cells that a growth factor will activate uh, a receptor on the cell surface, and that will set off a cascade that funnels through BRAF down all the way to the cell nucleus, and that causes cell growth and the expression of uh, other proteins that are required for the cell to, uh, to grow and, and to double. When BRAF has that B600E mutation, that's like turning on a light switch. So the BRAF is on all the time. And ordinarily, BRAF is only turned on when it's signaled to turn on by uh, um, an activation signal from an outside stimulus. But with the V600E mutation, that, that protein is continuously activated. And we think that depending on what cells that activation occurs in, you may get uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, or you may have Erdheim-Chester disease. So uh, fortunately, uh, at the time that the BRAF mutation was first identified, there were also inhibitors available. And uh, I think many of us give credit to Juliana Roche for starting the first patients uh, uh, with Erdheim-Chester disease on the BRAF inhibitors. And the two that, are, that have been in, in the clinic the longest are Vemorafenib and Dibrafenib. And what they do is they go into this activating site, the, the uh, kinase uh, uh, phosphate binding site of, of BRAF, much in the way that a lock goes into, or a key goes into a lock and prevents that protein from being an active kinase. And so that shuts down signaling downstream at the, at the source of BRAF signaling. And as you've seen that in many patients, that's led to dramatic improvements in uh, the disease status. Um, unfortunately, you don't get something for nothing. And it, it turns out that most of the inhibitors are not specific. They're selective. And so they target the BRAF uh, V600E mutation, but they also target normal BRAF in other cells. And they target CRAF and a host of other proteins. And we think that these so-called off-target effects are responsible for some of the side effects that are associated with with these uh, medications. Although the BRAF mutation is the most common mutation in Erdheim-Chester disease, it's not the only mutation. And yesterday we heard from Ben Durham of um, uh, uh, Omar Abdul Wahab's lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, who gave us an update of all the different mutations that there are in, in Erdheim-Chester disease. And Curiously, and this is in some ways um, unique in this family of diseases, many of the mutations occur within a, a continuous signaling pathway. 
And so we talked about the uh, signals that go from the outside of the cell down through BRAF and down into proteins uh, called MEK and ERK. And those are the mutations that we see in BRAF and in uh, and RAS, which is just upstream or in front of, uh, of RAF, and in MEK, and in another protein called PI3 kinase. And these are all part of the same chain. And so when we give them arafenib or dibrafenib, we block things at this point. And when we give um, cobimetinib and trametinib, we block downstream, and we heard yesterday from Eli Diamond and Philip Janku how effective the uh, treatment can be when we block downstream. And in some ways, this is unique because blocking downstream of some of the upstream signaling doesn't always result in clinical improvement in, in all cancers, but it does in Erdheim Chester disease. In addition to those targeted agents, there are targeted agents for many of the mutations that we see in Erdheim Chester disease, and they've not all been tested clinically yet, and some of this is, is ongoing, but I think it offers real uh, hope for the future as, as we identify these mutations. We can really target the, um, the therapy and personalize it uh, for the individual patient who has uh, Erdheim Chester disease. There is always a concern at some point that resistance may develop. And sometimes that resistance can uh, develop by activation of pathways that bypass the uh, site of the mutation. Sometimes that resistance can develop by changes in things like the BRAF protein so that it no longer is inhibited by bemorafenib or dibrafenib. And we have to remember that, that we think that Erdheim Chester probably fits within the same paradigm that's been established for other cancers. And Bert Vogelstein at uh, Johns Hopkins, you know, re revolutionized this in colon cancer, finding that there are different mutations that correspond to each stage of colon cancer from the first uh, hyperproliferative bump in the colon all the way to the polyp. Uh, to small adenomas, and at each step there's a new mutation that takes that, that uh, colon cancer to the next level. Uh, that finding that Langerhans cell histiocytosis and Erdheim Chester disease may be part of the same uh, family is something that's led some of us to think that perhaps these diseases are in some ways connected, and in uh, patients who have both Langerhans cell histiocytosis and Erdheim Chester disease, they most commonly have the same mutation in both diseases, making us think that, that those two conditions are genetically linked. And commonly, the Langerhans cell histiocytosis is identified either at the same time that Erdheim Chester is diagnosed or is diagnosed earlier, making us think that, that Langerhans cell histiocytosis, at least in some patients, may be a precursor uh, lesion before the develop of er development of Erdheim-Chester disease, and that, that these diseases may exist in a continuum of other uh, monocytic cancers. And Langerhans cell histiocytosis and Erdheim-Chester sit probably at the less aggressive end of this, uh, but I think many of us have had patients who have other diseases in this family, like chronic myelomonocytic leukemia and acute uh, monoblastic leukemia that have the same mutations and are probably further evolutions of the original Erdheim-Chester disease. So uh, just in conclusion, most patients with Erdheim-Chester disease have uh, mutations in the so-called ras raf map kinase pathway. Uh, these mutations really help to facilitate diagnosis, and when one of these mutations is identified, I think more and more pathologists are uh, using that information and now considering Erdheim-Chester disease or other histiocytoses as potential uh, diagnostic entities. And these mutations are often uh, raise the possibility of targeted therapy, 
either of existing drugs or drugs that are currently in development. And I'll be happy to answer any questions at, at the coffee break.